is Linda Chen, your board chair. I'd like to welcome you to the public board meeting of the Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners. Uh, just a reminder to our guests, um, if, if you have not already done so, please mute your phone um, and, uh, and keep your, uh, your mic on mute unless you are one of the people who is, is speaking. Uh, I'm going to first start off by doing a roll call of the board uh, to identify who is, is a part of our meeting this evening. And just board members, remember, um, uh, we'll be doing the roll call through the vote. I would suggest the board members, as when we're going into the voting process, if you would just unmute, that way you'll be ready to answer um, as we go through. Uh, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Commissioner Bro uh, Brooks? Yes. Commissioner Frank? He was happy. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes, good. yes. Commissioner James. Yes. Commissioner McFadden. I'm here. Commissioner Reed. See. Present. Commissioner uh, Roberts. Here. Commissioner Sykes. Here. You and I am here. Uh, there are nine uh, members present. Uh, Commissioner Richardson is excused this evening um, due to illness. Is there a motion to reopen the meeting? So move, Bundima. Okay, is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, uh, Commissioner McFadden. I got you. Okay. Um, I'm going to do this a little bit different. Oh, no, I guess I better do it the right way. Commissioner Bondima, are you in favor of reopening the meeting? Yes. Um, okay. Commissioner Brooks? Yes. Frank? Yes, yes. Okay. James? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Reed? Yes. Roberts? Yes. Sykes? Yes, and I am in favor, and I uh, so that is uh, nine in favor, and that motion passes. Thank you. At this time, um, I'm going to um, ask that we take some time to recognize uh, the passing of some uh, city school employees. Uh, they will be remembered, we know, fondly by the greater city school community. And tonight, we as a board um, are sending our deepest condolences to their friends and family. Uh, first is uh, William Kimmick. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Mr. Kimmick served in city schools for five years as a teacher at Wildwood Elementary. He unfortunately departed on September the 12th, 2020, and will be greatly missed by his family, friends, and the city school community. Leslie Faison served in city schools for eight years as a teacher at Calvin M. Rodwell. Ms. Faison departed on September the 15th, 2020, and she also will be greatly missed by her family, friends, and the city school community. Joyce Schultz Bittner served in city schools for 26 years as a teacher at Graceland Park, O'Donnell Heights. Ms. Schultz Bittner unfortunately departed on September the 14th, 2020, and will be greatly missed by her family, friends, and the city schools community. Can I ask if you would join me for a moment of silence um, uh, as you remember these three staff members? Thank you. And now is there a motion um, to approve the prior open session minutes? So move. Bundina. Bundina, is there a second? Second, Robert. Commissioner Roberts. Um, and um, those in favor, uh, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Brooks? Yes. Frank? Yes. James? Yes. 
McFadden. Yes. Yes. Roberts. Yes. Sykes. Yes. Okay, and I'm in favor. And so uh, this motion also passes. Is there a motion to approve the closed session summaries? So moved, so moved Frank. Thank you. And a second? Second read. Thank you. And um, those in favor, Commissioner Bondima? Oh, yes. Brooks? Yes. Frank? Yes. James? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Reed? Yes. Roberts? Yes. And I'm in favor, and so that is eight uh, in favor, and this motion also passes. Thank you. As, um, as a, the comments that I have for this evening, I want to uh, take time on behalf of Baltimore City Public Schools uh, to thank the myriad of donors who contributed to the COVID-19 emergency fund at the Fund for Educational Excellence on behalf of city schools. We sincerely appreciate their generosity during this unprecedented time. These funds are being used um, for things such as food distribution, technology support, devices, internet, and support for families as they navigate distance learning. Hundreds of donors contributed to this fund. And while we would like to publicly thank each and every one of them individually, uh, we're only able to acknowledge the donations over $5,000 by name. And so I'm going to share those. Uh, the Able Foundation, Adrian Amos, American Trading and Production Corporation, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, Bernard Family Fund of T. Rowe Price, Bess Keller and Michael Tarrant of BCF, Carlton and Betsy Sexton, Cohen Opportunity Fund of the Associated, E. Original, Goldsecker Foundation, Harry and Carter Brigham, Ira and Edgar Ringler Foundation, James and Mary Miller of T. Rowe Price, Middendorf Foundation, Mike Henley and Kathy Benson, Nancy Savage, Northrop Grumman, Open Society Institute, Pat Campbell Fund of BCF, Paula Singer, PNC Foundation, Roch Foundation, Rembrandt, Rembrandt Foundation, CQ, Sinai Hospital, T-Mobile, Thalheimer Uric Charitable Fund, the Alvin and Fannie B. Thalmeyer Fund Foundation, Her, uh, the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation, the Herbert Bierman Foundation, the Joseph Meyerhoff Fund, the Lois and Irving Blum Fund Foundation, the Philip and Burl Sachs Family Foundation, the Shelter Foundation, the Sherman Family Foundation, and Toyota USA Foundation. We would also like to thank the Fund for Educational Excellence for receiving these funds on behalf of city schools and supporting us through this, this period. In addition to the emergency fund, we'd like to publicly thank other donors who have contributed to city schools efforts. These donors are supporting signature initiatives at the district and we greatly appreciate their support. Charles and Lynn Sh uh, Shusterman Family Foundation and their gift of, am I reading this correctly? It was it uh, uh, Mr. Um, Christian Gant, was it 1 million or 600,000? It's 1 million 600,000. 1 million 600,000, that's so big, I'm, I could hardly believe it, thank you. <laughs> $1,600,000 towards summer initiatives. Family again? Under Armour. Who were they again? 
That was the Charles and Lynn Shusterman Family Foundation. I'm going to say that one again. One million six hundred thousand towards summer initiatives. Thank you. Under Armour Incorporated and their gift of nine hundred seventy-five thousand eight hundred sixty-nine dollars towards high school gym renovations. The Wallace Foundation and their gift of $145,000 toward the Equity Office. Dream Big Foundation and their gift of $116,360 towards the Cherry Hill Partnership. Annie Casey Foundation and their gift of $70,000 toward the Blueprint Leadership. And also their gift of $70,000 toward the Equity Office. The Baltimore Community Foundation and their gift of $50,000 toward tutoring. And the Baltimore Community Foundation's gift of $91,875 to support the district's beauty centers. Chiefs for Change and their gift of $50,000 towards providing internet access. The Jacob and Hilda Blaustown Foundation and their gift of $25,000 towards the Blueprint Student Wholeness. Abel Foundation's gift of $20,000 towards the CTE policy analysis. Mike Hinke and Kathy Benson and their gift of $5,000 toward the Be More STEM program. We will continue to publicly recognize our generous donors um, at, at, our, at the next board meeting, and particularly those who have contributed to the COVID Food Stability Fund. And to all of these folks that we've read, those even that we did not, uh, a big thank you on behalf of the Baltimore City Public School uh, for what you're doing to help our students. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. Should we, be thanking, should we be thanking Tina High Cover also, or no? Go ahead. I mean, I just, I think, I know Tina High Cover, her group runs this department, and I would like to thank her and her department for uh, the efforts they made in raising money. I think that's most appropriate. Thank you, and I see her um, here, so thank you, um, Ms. High Cover, and, and the work of your office in um in securing many of these donations and, and really uh, telling the story of what Baltimore City Schools are doing. Would you like to say anything? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Reedy. Thank you, Commissioner Chinia. I would just also offer that there's a team at City Schools that works on this, Dr. Sarah Heaton, uh, Chief Allison Perkins-Cohen, Cleo Hirsch, the Fund for Educational Excellence, my associate Karen Deliberto, Monique Sims have all been sort of instrumental in getting these grants and, and Dr. Sengalesis, of course. Um, and making sure we get these grants in. But thank you for the acknowledgement. It's been a lot of work, and we really appreciate the fund for really supporting us in these efforts. Again, thank you. <laughs> okay. That was great news. Uh, and now, is there a motion to approve the personnel, employment, and payroll, the PEP, and the quasi judicial matters? So moved. Uh, Commissioner McFadden, uh, second. Robert. Like Commissioner Roberts, thank yeah. you. Okay, and uh, the, all those who are in favor, Commissioner Bondima? Is she still there? Commissioner? Yes. Oh, okay. Commissioner Brooks, are you in favor? Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Frank? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Uh, Reed? Yes. Thank you. Robert? Okay, yes. I see you. Okay. And I'm in favor. Um, no, uh, no one opposed, no stay. So that is eight in favor, uh, one absent. I make sure I, I'm sorry I didn't do that last time. So that motion passes. And at this time, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Dr. Santelisis for CEO comments. Thank you, Chair Chenya and uh, commissioners. It is Good to see everyone this evening. I want to first invite uh, Chief Grant Skinner to um, for this evening's PEP agenda.
Thanks, Dr. Santelises. Um, first tonight, um, Kieran Sandu, Educational Associate uh, for ESOL, is appointed Educational Specialist 2 for ESOL, effective October 14th. Uh, next, Paris Crocker, uh, former coordinator of specialized learning, um, is returning to be appointed as Educational Specialist 2 for specialized instruction, effective October 14th. Uh, Tammy Evanowski, uh, blended learning resource teacher uh, in Baltimore County Public Schools, is appointed Educational Specialist 2, Instructional Leadership, effective October 19th. Zahara Valentine, principal at Baltimore Design School, is assigned Director of Educator Pipelines and Induction, effective October 14th. William Morant, Talent Manager, is assigned Director of Talent Management, effective October 14th. Diane Sellers, Manager of Teacher Recruitment and Selection, is assigned Director of Recruitment and Selection, effective October 14th. And Darren Brozine, currently Assistant Principal at Baltimore Design School, is appointed interim principal at Baltimore Design School, effective October 14th through June 30th, 2021. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chief Grant Skinner, for this evening's PEP. Um, I do want to uh, draw attention, as has become our practice, um, to Mr. Darren uh, Brozine, who is in his 15th year in Baltimore City Schools. He was most recently an assistant principal at Baltimore Design School. Uh, Darren was previously a model and lead teacher um, at Forest Park High School, where he taught courses in social studies while also supporting new and veteran teachers over the course of 12 years. Um, after graduating from Washington College in Chestertown, Maryland, uh, Darren began his career here through the Baltimore City Teaching Residency. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in teaching from Johns Hopkins University. Darren also trained to become a city schools principal through the district's new leaders program. Uh, uh, please can join me in congratulating Darren on his appointment at in, as interim principal at Baltimore Design School. Uh, I do know that former principal Valentine's uh, work over the many years, um, she has assured me um, on many of an occasion that uh, she has uh, succession planning in place. And so I think it's a statement both to her leadership um, as well as interim principal uh, Rosine uh, for his work as well. So welcome aboard and uh, and thank you. Um, the board chair, uh, board chair Chinya, um, took care of um, all of the donations for this evening. So she helped me along um, in my comments. I did want to just draw attention um, to uh, the, the, the Chiefs for Change um, donation that she cited um, came from the Players Foundation. Um, specifically, so Chiefs for Change in collaboration um, with them. And then, you know, also a thank you to all of the funders um, that, uh, that that Commissioner uh, Chinia uh, reflected and um, uh, particularly uh, a lot of our local folks um, like Baltimore Community Foundation and others who um, stepped up as well as our national partners. So thank you for that. That ongoing support um, is definitely... Um, it's now my great pleasure to congratulate uh, Mr. Wyatt Oroke, who I know affectionately as many students do, uh, Mr. O, who is the 2020 Teacher of the Year for the state of Maryland. Mr. O teaches, yay, give a shout out. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. O teaches seventh and eighth grade ELA um, English language arts at City Springs Elementary Middle School um, under the leadership of Principal Rhonda Raketa. And, and he is a nationally recognized educator for his work around social justice and promoting literacy. Uh, Mr. O also serves as the middle school team leader, the girls volleyball coach, 
the boys basketball coach, and a host of other roles at his school and in the community. He has received several state and national awards for his teaching, including awards from Johns Hopkins University, the University of Baltimore, the Maryland State Senate, the Baltimore Orioles. He was also awarded the Superhero Award by Ellen DeGeneres, where he was featured twice on her show. Mr. O was a 2019 Teacher of the Year semifinalist for Baltimore City Public Schools. He is the third city schools teacher to be named Maryland Teacher of the Year in the past six years. And um, I will just say I had the opportunity to uh, visit actually the privilege, his middle school um, students and some of his team colleagues um, allowed me the opportunity to sit in as we celebrated Mr. O. Um, and I will tell you, I was heartened um, that one thing is true for those of us who have taught and who continue to teach, those who continue to teach, is your students are actually the best testament to the power of your work. And when I say on that one call, uh, we had generational students um, logging in, chiming in to talk about his impact. So congratulations to Mr. O, who comes in a long line um, of Baltimore City, recognized and extraordinary educators. Um, you represent us well. Congratulations, sir. Also, um, October is National Principals Month, and I am very pleased uh, to express my gratitude for everything our school leaders have done on behalf of our students, staff, and families. Uh, without a doubt, the principalship is one of the toughest jobs in public education. I am not confused by that, um, and that is on a regular day but particularly in the middle of a pandemic, um, this job is, is weighty at best. But our principals continue to demonstrate the highest levels of leadership and dedication. I want you all to know um, that I am truly grateful for your commitment uh, and I am confident that you will continue to do whatever is necessary to enable our student success um, I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate this year's Heart of the School winners and honorees. Um, as many have come to know, the Heart of the School um, really extravaganza or gala every year to celebrate our school leaders is, I will say, one of the events I look most forward to every year. Um, since we cannot celebrate, uh, their accomplishments in person um, at the Hippodrome Theater, as we normally do, uh, we are inviting these principals uh, to attend our next virtual board meeting on October 27th so we can recognize them publicly. Um, and so in anticipation for that public celebration, I'd like to announce that the 2020 Heart of the School honorees first are Ashley Moore from Empowerment Academy, Brandon Pinkney from Walter P. Carter Elementary Middle School, K uh, Katrina Foster um, at Hamden Elementary Middle School, Principal Mike Dubai at Fort Worthington Elementary Middle School, and Tiffany Halsey at the Bel Air Edison Middle School. So congratulations to our honorees. And then I would also like to recognize the 2020 Heart of the School winners. And they are Amber Kilcoyne at Medford Heights Elementary, Principal David Guzman at Mary E. Rodman Elementary, Jill Manco at Liberty Elementary, um, now formerly at Liberty Elementary, now with the Abel Foundation, uh, Mark Gaither at Wolf Street Academy, and Zahara Valentine from Baltimore Design School. Congratulations also to our Heart of the School uh, 2020 winners. And we uh, are so proud of you, your accomplishment. Um, we look forward to celebrating you even more. And a real special thanks to Roger Schulman and the Fund for Educational Excellence uh, just for their partnership and support 
in recognizing our top performing principals and all of our principals. The fund has put on events for our principals, loved on our school leaders um, in just ways that acknowledge how special they are. And so we really thank you for the continued partnership as we uh, really endeavor to continue to celebrate uh, excellence in school leadership. So thank you very much. Um, speaking of wonderful accomplishments, um, I also want to give just a huge shout out to Cleo Hirsch, uh, Sonia Goodwin, Baltimore City Parks and Recreation, and everyone involved in helping students at our student learning centers, especially the site leads, the proctors, and our rec and park staff. Um, I think it is so important to recognize that our site leads and proctors stepped up to help our students negotiate our learning platform so they could benefit from virtual learning, even though that wasn't their regular job. Our proctors are normally bus drivers, they're bus aides, they're hall monitors, non-instructional aides, and our site leads um, are drawn from resident principals and other positions. As a matter of fact, I was telling some of the resident principals in that role that I met that they have probably had one of the best leadership immersion experiences that they will carry and will be a distinction. And I want to thank them as well. I think I all of these um, city schools team partners have in common is really a shared commitment to do whatever is necessary to help our students be successful. Um, I have visited sites regularly. Um, I've seen people like uh, Mr. Gibson, Ms. Scott, uh, Mr. Alate at Waverly. Um, I've seen Mr. Brunson and Ms. Va Vaughn um, at Baybrook. Uh, I've got a chance to meet Ms. Carter and uh, Ms. Dobbins at Pimlico, uh, Mr. Turner and Ms. Hamat at Mary E. Rodman, and Ms. White and Ms. Smith at Sandtown Winchester. I wish I had time to recognize everyone, um, our cafeteria staff and food nutrition staff, and so many of the volunteers who've worked so hard to provide meals for our students and families since March, and for putting our families first, and for walking the talk on behalf of our young people. I've had the chance to see family members uh, dropping their children off so they could go to much needed jobs without worrying about their children. I've heard that some of our proctors enjoy their work and students so much they are thinking about making a career change to educator positions. I had to warn Director Moore at Rec and Parks that I was personally recruiting um, a young um, en mechanical engineering student at Morgan State, a young man who is just fabulous with our young people. Um, and I was already recruiting him to come and teach math because he was teaching it that day anyway um, within city schools. And one of the things that I have seen continually as a continual theme um, really has been the positive things that are going on in our student learning centers. Um, and despite some of the highly inaccurate and, and quite frankly, self-serving claims that I have seen on Facebook, it has been done safely. And it's been done in alignment with health and safety protocols. I have seen in person, on the ground, with parents, students, educators, what happens when adults care about kids. And I frankly am inspired to do more Later this week, as promised, um, I will announce our plans for how we will handle the balance of this semester and the rest of the school year. Tonight, I want to share just briefly some of the thoughts that are guiding our decision making. The question I have been centering on in this moment is the meaning of the word essential. I've been thinking about what and who is essential. Our essential responsibility is to meet the needs of all our students, especially those who are most vulnerable. We know that not all of our students are thriving in this virtual environment. 
it's not working for too many English learners, too many kindergarten students. It's working. It's not working for too many of our homeless students. It's not working for the students who are not logging in every day. Before this crisis, we already had too many students not on the path towards family sustaining income. Before this crisis, we understood the persistent impact summer learning loss has on students not engaged in sustained meaningful summer learning. We knew about the compounded impact of missed classes and chronic absence, particularly on our students of color, our low in students from low income and under-resourced communities. We know these gaps, if unaddressed, become determinants of future quality of life indicators for our young people. We already know that education systems not centered in meeting the needs of all students have created inequities that persist to this day. I did not take this position as CEO to continue that path. We must disrupt. We have to meet our essential obligations to educate and meet the needs of all our students, including the ones we know we are not reaching virtually. I have been purposeful in taking stock of where we are and intentional in assessing our readiness to do more and what the essential conditions are for success, starting with ensuring our buildings are safe. We have to keep staff and students safe. That's essential. For some staff and students, continu continuing virtually will be essential. This includes ensuring staff and students who need health specific accommodations receive them. We have and will continue to work closely with the city health department to ensure that we adhere to approved guidelines at every site, every day. What keeps me up at night is knowing that we have students who need more from us. We have to do more. We know the real life results for our students if we don't. We cannot add to the numbers of students who do not learn to read by third grade. We cannot add to the number of students who graduate from city schools not prepared to earn a living wage. It is essential we do more, that we disrupt this cycle. Our students need and deserve more. The time requires more. That concludes my remarks for this evening. Thank you, Chair Chinia and Board of Commissioners. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Dr. Dr. Santelisis. Um, I'm going to keep that word. Um, that's a, a another definition for me for essential, and I want to thank you. Um, as we as we um, talk about, and you mentioned um, um, awards for principals and teachers and things. I just want to publicly, uh, on behalf of the board, just acknowledge. Um, that we are very proud because we have a, a CEO who is actually a finalist for a national award, and it's the Green Garner Award, uh, which is an award for outstanding leadership in urban education. And I think just listening to your your uh, comments a moment ago, we can understand just why you are in that rank. And so we are we are hopeful. Uh, we we know how we feel, but we're hopeful that. Um, that that will play out in the end and that we will we'll, we'll be coming back and saying that we actually have the winner of that award. But even so, we just want you to know how proud we are that you have been acknowledged in that way. Um, and as you have said, that it is essential that we break this cycle and do what needs to be done for our students. So thank you. Um, at this time, we are we are going to have our first um, um, item of information and discussion and um, we'll have a presentation from the office of new initiatives uh, this is a request from afia baltimore incorporated to change their um, operation structure and so i'll turn it over good evening um, I'm Angela Alvarez. I'm the executive director of the Office of New Initiatives. It's good to see you, all of you guys. And uh, congratulations, Dr. Santelises, on that, um, being a finalist for that award. It, 
And good evening. Uh, my name is Trevor Roberts. I'm a specialist in the Office of New Initiatives. Um, tonight we'll be presenting a request from Office of Baltimore um, on the structure of their operating organization. Um, whenever we receive a request from an operator that requires board approval, um, we look at a few key considerations. So I'm just going to go over how we vet these requests. Um, we look at the um, operator's evidence of demand or capacity to Im implement the change. We look at the school's rationale about how the change meets a school need. We look at evidence of how stakeholders were involved in vetting and approving the request. We look at the quality of programming offered by the school and the building capacity if the request um, involves enrollment. Um, so when an operator submits a request to the Office of New Initiatives, um, we determine whether the request um, meets established guidelines. So that means is it um, um, does it agree with the charter law and the uh, contractual obligations of charter schools and things like that? Uh, we were we vet the request with key departments in city schools. Um, and then we, for requests that meet those uh, guidelines, we present the request to the board for information and the board will be voting on this request at the October 27th meeting. So this request comes from off your Baltimore and just to orient the board to that organization, um, they run a network of three charter schools, the Bel Air Edison School, which serves grades pre-K through seven. Afia Public Charter School, which serves grade eight. And just as a reminder to the board, um, Bel Air Edison and Afia Public Charter School are going through a process of combining the two schools so that by next year, they will be a single um, pre-K to eight charter school. Um, and that school will be called the Bel Air Edison School. So Afia Public Charter School will um, become part of Bel Air Edison. And right now the third school that they operate is Tunbridge Public Charter School. So um, the contracts for Afia and Tunbridge are currently held directly by Afia Baltimore. And the contract for Bel Air Edison is held by Brems Lane Public Charter School LLC, which is a subsidiary of Afia Baltimore. The request that um, we're presenting to the board tonight from AFIA is two parts. The first part is to reassign the contract for Bel Air Edison School from the current um, LLC, Brems Lane, to Bel Air Edison School LLC. These are actually um, the same organization. Um, the reason for the difference in name is that uh, Bel Air Edison used to be named Brems Lane Public Charter School. Um, so this is an update to that organization to reflect the change in the school name to Bel Air Edison. Um, other aspects of the LLC's organization other than the name remain the same. The second request is to reassign the contract for Tunbridge uh, from off of Baltimore to a newly created LLC called Tunbridge School LLC. So um, as I said, this is a newly created LLC, um, but it will remain under the umbrella of Afia Baltimore. Um, and the newly created LLC shares Afia's nonprofit status, tax ID number, operating board and executive directors and other uh, aspects of the organization. Uh, the reason that Afia is requesting this change is because they are going through a refinancing of um, some of the school buildings that they own privately. So as part of that refinancing, um, the school's lender is requesting these changes. Um, the changes that, that we're looking at tonight will uh, not affect school operations, and they are um, only regarding the legal structure and who holds the actual charter contracts. So those are the um, requested changes. So if 
uh, the board has any questions, um, we can take those at this time. And just, just a reminder in the timeline, this will come back for a vote at the next board meeting. Uh, if if there if a board member has a question, if you just state who you are um, and go ahead. If not, okay. Well, hearing none, then um, thank you. And that as was as was was stated, we will be voting on this at the at the next board meeting. Please note um, the current screen that indicates if there are additional questions, how you can contact that office. Uh, in terms of submitting those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to be reviewing the uh, consent agenda. Just a reminder that we will not be voting uh, now. Um, I'm just going to read them. If a board member uh, would like to have an uh, item removed, please state a specific question that you might have for staff so they can be prepared to answer those. We will uh, come back to the consent agenda after public comment. Um, item 8.01, which is policy um, IHBB gifted and talented, I mean, gifted and advanced learning second reader. Item 8.02, policy ACH nur uh, nursing parents second reader. They're both going to be. Meeting uh, like a work meeting. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, I believe that was Trevor, but he's muted now. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. So, so those two items are 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 being pulled um, for uh, unless there's another question, they're being pulled for vote for the student. Okay. Uh, 12.01 Johns Hopkins University Center for Talented Youth. 12.02 Great Minds PBC. Uh, Madam Chair, I pulled two, 1202 and 1203. Uh, just explanation in terms of how that relates to CARES. Okay, 12.03 is Math and Literacy Intervention Programs. You want to know how they relate to CARES? It both are funded through CARES program, and I would just wonder uh, understand how the whole the whole dynamic in terms of CARES funding, how it relates to spending for these two programs, and how it relates to the timeline for the program. All righty. Thank you. Twelve point zero four fund for educational excellence, and twelve point zero five duty centers. Okay, so we have um, four items that have been pulled, um, 8.01, 8.02, and then 12.02 and 12.03. Okay, so now we'll, we will move into public comment. Um, reminder that speakers from recognized groups have the opportunity to speak for five minutes. Um, and first, we have a video, I believe, from Ms. Diamond Tay Brown, who is the president of the Baltimore Teachers Union. Madam Chair, we usually try to wait until six, actually. Oh, sorry about that. I, you know what? I forgot. I took my watch off and then forgot yep. to take a look at my watch. Okay. So then let's. If the other information. If move to the other information item, then. Thank you very much. Um, we'll come back to that at six o'clock. Uh, the other information item, which is the uh, financial update, if the finance office is ready and can. Thank you. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Board okay. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Mr. Durden. Uh, we're it. happy to go now um, at, at any time. And I will um, project my screen. And if if uh, Madam Board Chair, I could ask you to confirm that you're seeing my screen uh, for that kind of reassurance before I launch in. 
We see your screen. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chris Doherty. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. And uh, tonight we'll be talking to you about a, a financial update, uh, which will include, importantly, um, the FY20 financial summary closeout, which was um, uh, recently concluded, and how that closeout uh, impacts um, our current situation and looking forward. And um, I will also be joined uh, later on by Deputy Chief uh, Marianne Cox. And we're very happy to have this time um, with you all to update you on the important item of, of uh, finances. Um, an earlier draft of this, I think, had some mention of some enrollment adjustments. Uh, those were um, those will not be part of tonight's uh, discussion, but it's possible that an earlier agenda item has that on there. Um, that was um, that was taken off, and um, it wasn't originally part of the agenda. It was added, and then uh, it came off. But there's lots of material to cover uh, now. So what we're hoping to do in our time tonight is uh, to make some introductory comments about our financial situation. Uh, we want to talk about uh, closing the gap, and the gap there from the financial point of view was the financial gap that we uh, were staring at um, in the difference between all of the new COVID-related costs that we were experiencing and, and will continue to have, and the additional COVID-related uh, revenues that we got uh, from uh, federal, state, local, and some philanthropic uh, sources. From there, we will talk in detail about the FY20 general fund, uh, including revenue expenditures uh, and uses, uh, which is the standard way to present it. Um, a little bit of background before we jump into the update, background known uh, very well to the board and to others, and that is um, as we were continuing to grapple with uh, COVID-related activities. Uh, we estimated in August uh, that we had about $131 million in COVID-related costs uh, that we were experiencing. And we, uh, as the board knows and others know, um, we, the, the district that is, received uh, federal, state, and local additional revenues to apply towards the, these costs in the amount of approximately $77 million. Uh, we also, from the very beginning in March, were um, doing whatever we could to repurpose and to uh, preserve funds, um, and we did that to the tune of about $17 million. Um, when we were looking at how much from FY20 we would have to apply towards FY21 and beyond costs, we estimated that we would have in the range of $16 million uh, to do that. Uh, and that is uh, the math, the arithmetic that led to an estimate of approximately $21 million gap uh, due to uh, COVID-related activities in FY21. That is the gap that I refer to and that we've been working um, uh, very diligently to address ways to close, because as the board is uh, well aware, we are not in a position to be able to deficit spend even for just one period under extenuating circumstances. We are uh, required by law to, to have a balanced budget uh, in the same period. So when we first identified the $21 million gap, um, we simultaneously had to uh, identify ways to close that gap. Um, <clears throat> and also, um, to not to put too fine a point on it, but we, um, as the board knows, the approved FY21 budget uh, contained no COVID-related costs. Um, a budget like ours, a public, large public budget, is a multi-month uh, production. Uh, it typically takes about nine months, and the timing of uh, COVID and the approval of the FY21 budget resulted in the fact that the budget that was approved in early May for FY21 just did not contain any COVID-related costs. So that's what led us to have to identify uh, very quickly ways to close um, that gap. So um, we had estimated previously um, the 16 million, uh, a little bit of context on that number. We had estimated um, in materials to the board approximately $20 million that we thought would be available to apply towards COVID-related activities. We had a plus or minus 20% uh, um, factor 
on that $20 million estimate, which then came to be called 16 million because uh, 20 million less 20% is 16 million. Of course, 20 million plus 20% is 24 million. And as it turns out, when we closed FY20, we were quite pleased that we were on the slightly higher side of that estimate. That is to say, we had $26 million available uh, because of the savings, because of the um, activities that we put in really from the beginning in mid-March when this uh, period began. And so with the application of that $26 million towards FY21 COVID costs, that estimated $21 million gap um, came, you know, comes down to a more manageable but still quite um, significant $11 million gap. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and interestingly, because this this proposed this uh, presentation was prepared some days ago, but it it really rings true with Dr. Sanalisis's comments about um, things that are essential. And uh, there are certain items and certain conditions that city schools must have in place to ensure safe and successful schools for our children. Um, and and those things are or they include clean, safe buildings for children and staff. There's just no way to proceed with any kind of instruction if you don't first ensure that you have clean, safe buildings for children and staff. Um, related to that is we need to have ample supplies of uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and we, we have to continue to have connectivity devices and support uh, for our students to address uh, the digital divide that came out uh, so clearly um, in, in recent months. So <clears throat> those are just some examples of absolutely essential uh, items and conditions that we have to have in place. And again, the FY21 budget um, was passed and it didn't have, didn't have any PPE COVID uh, related costs. So with the 26 million that we were able to harvest in the FY20 closeout, we did what we uh, know Dr. Sanalisis and you would have us do, which is we, had, we aimed them directly at these must haves, these absolute uh, non-negotiable items like uh, building safety enhancements and increased cleaning for 9 million, uh, 8 million uh, went to or has been set aside for, it hasn't already gone to, uh, PPE barriers, safety signage and reminders and the, <clears throat> the 9 million uh, is for connectivity, technology, uh, and ongoing support. The items that hopefully show in your slide as red, uh, those red amounts, not in the original FY21 budget, represent the 26 million referenced at the top. <clears throat> now, uh, just a, a couple of quick comments, because uh, as we all know, there are, there are uh, deeper stories behind all of these, but but on the, the clean and safe buildings, we, we just one item, just air filters. Um, we, I think our amazing operations team has, uh, has learned even more about air filters than they already knew, which was quite a bit. But uh, typical air filters are not uh, sufficient in these extraordinary circumstances. There's, there are special MERV 13 air filters, um, among others. Um, some air filters can be incorporated into the HVAC systems of schools. Other schools that are not yet tricked out with HVAC systems need to have standalone air filtration systems and operations absolutely positively has to have uh, the necessary funds to do all that. And, and they will because, and they do, because these are um, essential, like Dr. Sanalisa said. But just those air filters alone, to give a, an illustrative example, that's several million dollars right there in costs that were not part of any FY21 budget. The PPE uh, that we're all now so familiar with, um, even something as straightforward as uh, three student cloth masks, uh, you know, or three student cloth masks per child and two adult masks, that's over a quarter of a million masks right there, just as a starting point. Um, and um, let's face it, kids, uh, kids forget their masks, uh, kids lose their masks. and. Let's also admit that adults uh, forget their masks and adults uh, lose their masks. And we can never not have enough masks. Uh, no, so we will always have enough masks. We will always make sure uh, that we have ample supplies. That's 
just a uh, meant to be just a little bit of a, a slightly deeper dive into some of these categories and uh, the importance of having sufficient funds to do these. One, one other comment is um, when we talk with our peers across uh, the nation and they're dealing with the exact same thing, um, we find that in every district, um, the funds that they got from the federal government, we found that every district was appreciative of the funds that they got and every district says it's not enough. It, it isn't enough. It's not even really close to enough. And that's what led us to take proactive steps to make sure that we had sufficient funds for the essential activities that we're charged with uh, providing funds for. Um, so as the board knows and as uh, the system knows and the public knows, from the very beginning, uh, we have endeavored to save funds wherever possible. Uh, we implemented a spend spending freeze. We implemented a hiring freeze in the spring. We reduced third-party contractor costs wherever we could, contract by contract, and we renegotiated transportation uh, contracts. That uh, Those things bore fruit. Uh, they were not easy steps, but they did bear fruit. And later on in the presentation, uh, we will walk through uh, where we had surpluses by category when we closed out our FY20 uh, books. And for those who may have to check or uh, who are uh, less familiar, the FY20 year ended uh, 6.30, uh, uh, 20. So FY20 went up till the end of June and then FY21 began on July 1st. And we've been, uh, we've been managing uh, ever since uh, with those funds. We're finding, uh, we're finding that this is really more of a marathon uh, than a sprint. I think a lot of us were hoping that it, this period would be measured in weeks or months. And, uh, and it's going to be measured in years. And we have adopted an attitude um, that, that reflects the immediacy of needing the absolutely essential items and conditions for our students as uh, they uh, prepare to return to in-person learning, while at the same time knowing that this is not just an FY21 challenge, it's an FY22 challenge and beyond. Um, so, uh, this slide that hopefully you're looking at is is, a, is showing how we we did things beginning in FY20 and we're continuing to do them in FY21. And frankly, uh, we we did take uh, we proposed and they were agreed to to take multiple prudent steps to adapt to our very new and different reality and ensure financial stability for FY21 and beyond. Um, we. We discontinued um, the employment of uh, temps, uh, which was a difficult decision, um, but it, 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 it represented millions of dollars in savings um, and savings that we can use and are using for specifically those categories uh, that we talked about a few moments ago. We continue to be repurposing grant funds wherever allowable. Uh, different grants have different allowable uses and you have to go grant by grant and see what what can be done with those funds and what uh, may not be done with those funds and where appropriate, we have repurposed those grant funds um, uh, quite energetically. And we've also, uh, we continue to have a hiring freeze uh, at the school level and uh, also now at the district level, all with those goals um, in, in sight. Um, it's not been an easy period and it frankly won't get um, uh, any easier anytime uh, soon, but um, we have met the most immediate challenges. That is to say, for the FY21, the year that we are in, we, we have good line of sight uh, based on the additional funds we applied from FY20 and the actions that we've taken that we project that by the end of the year, we will, of course, um, balance, which we have to, but we will, we have line of sight to balance um, by the end of the year. The reward for getting through FY21 uh, in good shape is, is FY22. Uh, FY22 is shaping up to be extraordinarily challenging for multiple reasons. Um, some of them are related to COVID and some of them are not related to COVID. Um, we, right now, based on current law, uh, there, there is no Kerwin funding and there is no bridge to Kerwin funding. And that represents a drop in revenues in the tens of millions of dollars. 
Uh, and that's what finance is keeping an eye on as we continue to look at um, meeting the needs of our students now, uh, meeting the needs of our students as they return uh, to in, in-person learning when, whenever that happens, and then also looking at FY22 with an eye towards um, knowing that it will be at least as difficult as FY21 is shaping up to be, um, uh, if not more so because the COVID-related items will be compounded by potential significant loss in revenue that um, that is both not related to COVID on the one hand, but if um, receipts and other economic um, indicators are down, that of course has an impact on our uh, on our budget. So that those are these slides here. One other aspect that I want to make uh, I want to make sure we uh, talk about it is we just finished our external audit for our financial statements and we have received a clean audit that is to say an audit uh, with no findings for the 11th year in a row um, auditors uh, like to come up with findings that's that's what they do and that's what they are good at and for 11 years in a row um, baltimore city public schools has received a clean audit I think that's a remarkable achievement. I'm too new to have that be a reflection on me. That's why I'm pointing it out. Uh, it is a reflection on my colleagues. And I, I want to take a moment and recognize some of those. Uh, um, I will be brief, but it really is absolutely the right time to do so as we get our 11th clean audit in a row. Uh, some of my new colleagues uh, who play an unbelievably important role in doing that um, it's literally hundreds of thousands of transactions, and um, they do them extremely well in a short period of time. Uh, Wayne Godfrey, Lola Sule, Renee Calvi, Alicia Armorer, Deborah Winslow, Don Ferris, and Fatima Adewumi are outstanding colleagues, and they are the ones, along with Deputy Chief uh, Marianne Cox, who have now done 11 straight years in a row uh, with clean uh, financial audits. And it is to um, Deputy Chief Marianne Cox that I want to pass um, the control so that she can walk us through the FY20 um, closeout slides. Marianne? I think someone had their hand up. Did, uh, did yeah. Commissioner Reed have his hand up? Yeah, Chief. Uh... Uh, you, you mentioned the uh, the audit and how it was clean. Yes, but sir. Can you explain to me the? I don't know if you can pull it up. Page four of the audit, the uh, the opinion. Um, I don't have it up, but I can I can. Um, oh, I, I, I can read it to you if you want. Please. Because I need explanation in terms of. It doesn't sound super clean to me based on what they said. Our consideration of internal control was for a limited purpose designed described in paragraph first paragraph was not designed to identify all deficiencies internal control or material weaknesses or significant deficiencies uh, so is that perfectly clean if they're not if they're limited in terms of the scope of their their approach um, yes, they, they are. Um, the auditors never claim to catch every possible significant uh, deficiency or, uh, you know, material weakness. What they're saying is they go through generally accepted accounting uh, uh, procedures and they review our transactions on the basis of that, but they never. It is never their intent to catch everything. And I would only add, Commissioner Reed, that what you what you point out in plain English, you know, does uh, sound a certain way. That's standard auditor boilerplate. Um, uh, what's the right word? You know, just standard auditor stuff. So that. Uh, yeah, that, that's in every audit that I've been associated with, that they have those disclaimers, which actually do seem to water their findings down, but uh, it's it's a standard. It's nothing unique to Baltimore City. 
So what would be a limitation? What? What would be a limitation in terms of their scope? Well, I, I just, I take what you read as standard limitation. In other words, they they reserve the right that uh, there, there may be things that they, they uh, didn't review. You can't review all things. But when I say clean audit, and I think it's the, generally the uh, accepted usage of it is uh, they have no findings. They have a report and they say what they say, but they don't have an associated findings of, uh, you know, a, a findings letter. And so when you have findings, it's not a clean audit. And when you don't have findings, it is a clean audit. That that was the point I was I was trying to make. And and I and I hope it came across that um, as I'm pretty much a new arrival, I felt it was OK because I'm too new to have that seem like a compliment to anything I've done, but rather uh, what Mary Ann and my other colleagues have accomplished. OK, I just I just saw limitations and deficiencies. Yeah, I think um, I, I can actually find find out more. But my my strong feeling is that that's standard auditor boilerplate. Mary Ann, do you want to um, project for the, the, the next tabular slides? Well, since yours is already up there, why don't you just oh. go on to the next slide? By all means. OK. Um, uh, Mary Ann Cox, Deputy Chief Financial Officer. I'm going to present the slides on uh, general fund revenue, uh, general fund expenditures, and um, summary of general fund revenues, expenditures, and uses. Okay, uh, this is as of June 30th, 2020. Um, you can see the various revenue by sources that we have there. The first is the state of Maryland. You can see we get uh, uh, the most significant part of our revenue from the state of Maryland. The, uh, the balance that we did not get there relates to non-public revenue. When the schools were shut down, there were some services that were um, deferred for a period of time. So that's what uh, that one is uh, related to. The city of Baltimore, a spot on, right to the penny. Yes, I see a, a hand up, uh, Commissioner Reed. Do you, do you have a question, Commissioner Reed? And should be down. Is it down? Oh, no, no. So we'll just. Is that now? It is now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the city of Baltimore, the revenue is uh, right to the dollar. Federal sources of revenue, you can see we're, uh, uh, we're under budget. The federal sources include ROTC, impact aid, E-rate, and treasury subsidy. Um, the underages occurred this year in um, E-rate and Treasury subsidy, but it may just be that the revenue will flow over into the next year. Um, the next line is interest income. So uh, you can see that we had uh, significant uh, interest earnings. Now that interest earnings isn't just investment income. It is also um, an adjustment of our investments to market, which is what we must do at the end of each month. So sometimes that's a positive number, sometimes it's a big positive number, sometimes it's a, a lower number. Um, for other revenue, um, the biggest item in other revenue is MSA revenue. Now that's general fund revenue that MSA pays city schools to work with the 21st century program. So I, I also, you know, other revenue can be a lot of things. It's school police over time, it's non-resident tuition, it's summer school tuition, it's, um, you know, if people rent out the schools, they, they can, uh, that's where this money would go. So other financing sources, um, uh, 22 million, that is the amount that was in the budget to begin with. Uh, if you go back to the FY 2020 budget, you'll see that. So we have a total of $1.175 billion in revenue, 1.180 uh, in actual for a uh, an excess of revenue over budget of 5.4 
uh, million dollars. Okay, so the next one is uh, general fund expenditures by object. I just want to point out that this is budgetary basis. And what that means is that we take our actual expenditures, we um, subtract last year's encumbrances and add back this year's encumbrances. So it's this is a standard uh, reporting uh, for a budgetary basis. It's um, some people consider the, the best approximation of how you stand compared to budget. So you can see as we look down here for the favorable variances, because you can see a 1.175 billion budget with a 1.1 billion dollar actual. So you have $73 million um, under budget. Now, uh, there's not a big variance and salaries are fringe because we continue to pay our employees um, during the time of COVID. No, we did not. Now, our employees, not our non-employees. So um, temps and substitutes are not our employees. So, but everyone else, everyone who was a permanent employee continued to be paid. You can see for the, the size of the budget and the actual that contractual services had a higher variance, a variance about $16 million, and materials and supplies, $8.3 million. I, I believe that this can be directly related to the closed schools. Let us remember how the information was conveyed to us and, and all the other LEAs when schools closed. Remember, they told us on a Thursday that Friday, I, I believe that was uh, March the 12th, they told us that the next day would be our last day of school and then everything got closed for two weeks. Okay, and as, as that time period ended, uh, it's my recollection that, that they, um, uh, that they uh, did not, um, I think we closed for another three week time period. Do you know what I mean? It was piecemeal. And so some of this was difficult to know how to handle these decreases in uh, expenditures. Now, I will say that uh, what we ended up doing long term under contractual services was we made special agreements with our transportation uh, vendors. Remember that the CARES Act required that to the highest amount practicable, the LEAs were supposed to try to pay their vendors and to pay their um, employees. So we took that to heart and we we were required to comply with it. So, you know, the, the transportation vendor uh, contracts were a part of that. Now, um, for utilities and other charges, you see that there's a favorable variance of 9.7 million. Remember, um, travel was cut off. Uh, I believe it was either in late March or early April, they just said, nope, no more travel until I think it was at least the end of May. So there were expenditures that we knew we were not going to have. Um, debt service uh, makes sense. You know, our, we issue um, debt obligations and we're required to pay for them and we do each year. Now the, the transfers here, these transfers are a lot of different things. Uh, the biggest uh, uh, number in there is non-public, but it also has uh, Oakland IKC, uh, uh, the Department of Juvenile Services, the, the Department of uh, Health Services. You know, there's there's a lot of things that we pay other LEAs or agencies. Uh, to serve our students. So that would come down here. But just as I said that uh, the non-pub revenue was down, you can see the, uh, the non-pub expenditures were down as well. So here we have, <coughs> excuse me, a positive variance of $73.9 million, which is a sizable amount. Going to the next page, 
Here's just something I want to bring to your attention on uses. Please remember, this is being expressed in budgetary uh, uh, format. Uh, one thing I, I want to say is like if we just looked at the top two lines, the comparison to last year was our numbers this year is only 20 million higher than last year, which is kind of surprising uh, compared as last year was a relatively normal year. If you want to use those words, I'm not sure we know what normal is anymore. But um, and going down, the first two lines are all costs borne by the general fund. So the general fund is responsible for a lot of costs that are not on the general fund. Okay. So, um, all right, the other financing sources for FY 2021, the board had already approved a uh, other financing source for the FY 2021 budget of 15.3 million. Uh, these additional encumbrances, remember I, I spoke before about um, when you do budgetary basis, you take out last year's encumbrances and add back this year's encumbrances. So you can get some pretty wide swings. In this particular year, our encumbrances increased by uh, just about 4.6 million, which is a, a big swing for a single year. Um, and then uh, in at the, the general fund, uh, funds the deficits of the food services operation. So as we close the books for FY20 for uh, food services, uh, we had to do a fund balance transfer of $11.2 million. So, <coughs> excuse me. So we have uh, net operating results of 48.2 million. And then according to uh, the fund balance policy that we have, the board delegates their authority to uh, approve a signed fund balance to the CEO. So uh, generally what happens is the CFO uh, reviews uh, a lot of possible uses and then there are multiple conversations back and forth with, with the CEO. And then uh, this year, as you can tell, it just, uh, it, it appeared to be the best use of the money for uh, COVID uses. So the first one, we have building preparation, cleaning and safety enhancements for $9 million. So uh, that's to support return to in-person learning. And we have PPE, barriers, and, and signage. That's um, safety items to support return to in-person learning. So that's $8 million has been set aside. And uh, technology and connectivity support, uh, $9 million has been uh, set aside so that uh, city schools can ensure that students and staff have necessary resources to learn. You know, when we're in a, a world where our students are learning remotely, they must have the equipment and the connectivity to be able to uh, get access to the, the learning platform. Now, what we had done for food services uh, for next year, this is an increase from uh, where we were as we closed our FY uh, 19 books to 20. So we increased it by $19.5 million to support meal services during the COVID response in FY 2021. So um, hopefully, you know, I, I've heard that uh, our, our um, meals have been increasing and that's very good news. So uh, we'll look for other good news as, as we move along. And then we have an ERP system increase. This is to help various departments increase critical staffing support during the transition for the uh, district-wide systems. We, we have just put the uh, RFP for the ERP system out uh, 
I believe it was last Friday. So we're very much in the beginning phase of that. But as we move along through the various phases, we're going to um, require some contractual staffing to assist city schools, um, you know, so that we can have some of our staff work on the new ERP system, yet get everything done that must be done. So um, those would be the uses of the $48.2 million. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, that, if any uh, other questions come up at a later time, uh, please send them to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just have, have one, one thing, thing again, 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 folks, and I, and I, I want to uh, make sure it's in, it's in our minutes, minutes over and over. I'm hearing an echo. I'm sorry. Um, we just finished, we just completed an 11th year of a clean audit. So I just hope, please keep that in mind because I think that's an important message um, that needs to get out there. I'm going to move back now. Madam Chair. To, uh, and thank you. Yes. Uh, if, if Chris is still there, I just wanted to quickly just ask a question because he mentioned um, to us, um, Chief Darty, you mentioned. Um, and this could also be for our legislative folks, um, and it's and Dr. Santelisis again, with what we're looking at, right? Without the bridge to Kerwin, without Kerwin, mm -hmm. those that those that poses very serious implications um, to how right. we are going to move forward. And I'm just curious to know. I mean, I understand everyone's advocacy, um, you know, about a myriad of things. But given the fact that city schools has been uh, underfunded, right, and, and, and disenfranchised for so many years beyond local control, um, what is our role now in advocating, um, you know, with our elected officials, with our state um, legislators, with our federal legislators in figuring out some sort of support or some ways to start considering closing gaps that we are already anticipating ha having. And so we see that, yes, contractual folks, you know, we had to make tough decisions. The system had to make tough decisions because of where we were. And I appreciate you, Chief, um, for explaining that. But now as we're moving forward, we know that this is just going to continue to grow. Um, so what then should be, um, you know, some things that we should be doing um, and anticipating as we move forward um, for the sake of our children and our communities that are already suffering and struggling. And clearly COVID is just exacerbating all of the inequities that have existed um, for, for generations. Commissioner McFadden, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more on, on, on your comments and I think that, and I'm I'm glad you you raised them uh, from my presentation because just to say it again on the COVID part, the additional funds that we have received are not even close to the additional funds we need to spend, and I don't know any district that thinks th that it is close, and that's just COVID, as you point out. Then there's the whole existing. Um, uh, the ex the pre-existing situation, which was problematic as well. Uh, for example, the the revenue cliff that we may be going off in FY22 um, is in addition to the gap between uh, the COVID costs that are very real and we stack up um, and don't seem terribly um, discretionary. Right, that that when you look at a stack up of COVID related costs. I defy people to say, well, that wasn't necessary and that wasn't, they're, they're the definition of necessary and the funds uh, the funds that we've been provided are insufficient. I don't wanna speak above my pay grade, but I just think you're absolutely right uh, to focus on that, that it's just uh, in plain English, uh, we do not have enough funds to do what we must do. And um, um, I'm 
rooting. I, we follow the activities that happen in Washington, uh, and we're certainly we were hoping for another bill to come down um, that has had some ups and downs, but we all know it has it hasn't come through. Um, and I, I don't know what to say other than, from my point of view, to keep saying in plain English that we just don't have enough. No, and, and thank you, Chris. I think that was spot on. Um, Commissioner McFadden, um, <clears throat> this is part of why the work that, um, you know, Chris and Marianne, uh, both the, you know, the chief and the deputy and their team has been doing is so important because it allows us to be able to quantify and qualify what those additional expenses are and to continue to um, really educate and get out into the public dialogue what we know um, and the case making we made uh, during Kerwin. You know, we were able to challenge, um, you know, some of the things that are poured out into the public sphere about Baltimore City being among the highest paid when we know that those figures are linked to census data, right, and cost of living. We know what it means to actually, you know, look to people who understand school finance and equity issues within Maryland. So I think one, we've got to begin that campaign again. Um, and you and the board, frankly, were masterful in continuing to get that message out. And we're going to have to rev that up again. I think the second piece is having some real proposals on the table uh, for state policy and uh, state approaches to budgeting. So, for example, we know already that the state of Florida and the state of North Carolina have already made legislative decisions to hold school districts harmless for the coming school year. So not the school year we're in, but the year that Chris just referenced. 22. Exactly. Fiscal year 22, where we know that cliff is coming. And so I think to your point, um, it's an excellent time for a wake up call to be able to say, you know, we can't sleep just because um, we're dealing with all these other things. We've got to also have part of our strategy include doing what you just did right now. And that is calling out and saying, all, all the pandemic has done, all the racial and national unrest, the most recent, um, has done is just exacerbated where we were when we were making the case, you know, the last two to three years. So I'm, I'm glad you pointed it out. I'm glad the board is holding us to that. And, you know, there are real things we need to do message wise organizing wise and frankly with regard to legislate uh, with, with regard to legislative action as well because we're seeing it in other like I said North Carolina Florida have already done the hard work of saying we're, we're holding districts um, constant because they know that the enrollment data does not you know is not going to reflect a full school year and we're actually encouraged that some of our numbers didn't go down as much as they could have. But the reality is the same, and it's not just Baltimore City. It is across the state, it's across the country. It is just negatively impacting us um, in, in particularly hard and harsh ways. So you're, you're right to bring it up and hold us accountable for it. I think Missouri's in that Hold Harmless Club too, Dr. Senalisis, and it would be a great club to join. Agreed, thank you, Chris. Now we've got three, there's probably more this week. So and that's it's, and Thank you, Commissioner McFadden, for that question very much. Absolutely. And just very briefly, if we could possibly, and I know it would be more of a, uh, a, a board thing, but with those districts and those states that we've just named, it would be really interesting if we could be, if we could somehow connect with them um, just to help develop our strategy. And, and this is what I'm saying to my board colleagues as well. I mean, I know that we are all members of CUBE, of course, um, and the Council of Great City Schools. And I think it's critically important now um, to just converse with them, to talk more strategy as we move forward. And just finally, again, certainly we thank all of our philanthropic partners who uh, Chair Chenya named earlier, but that is, and we uh, clearly appreciate that. Right, but that is is still not going to be enough um, for the work that our children and our communities deserve 
Um, in what we've still been talking about, acceleration, but we clearly know that there's going to be a great deal of remediation needed as a result of where we are now. So thank, thank you, Chief, and, and to your team, uh, uh, Mary Ann Cox and everyone that you named earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. And then I would also say to board members, because this is this is a big week in terms of some of those organizations that we are affiliated with that are meeting. And so we need to uh, uh, take seriously our, our um, connections and advocacy. And, and um, as we are attending either the, the MABE conference or the Council of Race City Schools uh, to make some of those contacts that Commissioner McFadden was making. So please, uh, colleagues, remember that as we, uh, as we move forward. I want to thank the, uh, the public for your patience as we uh, adjusted the um, the uh, agenda a bit, um, but at this point, I'm going to go back to public comment, and um, we have a video from um, Ms. Diamond Tate Brown from the president for BTU. Uh, we Chris, don't have we sound. Can hear. Okay, you said sound didn't work. No, it didn't work. Correct. We didn't. Hear okay. Let me. I'm not sure why that is. Try something else. Okay, let's see if this. Sorry, folks, bear with me. Full okay. virtual learning. Is this working? To partial virtual learning yes. and partial in person learning, the district's proposed hybrid model. But is Christian, can we start it from the beginning? Okay. Good evening. It's become increasingly clear to BTU members that the CEO and the board had a keen interest in placing small groups of people in school buildings or work sites and that transitioning from full virtual learning to partial virtual learning and partial in-person learning, the district's proposed hybrid model, is one way to have small groups of people return to buildings for the purposes of operations or instruction. The BTU understands that the board believes that allowing small groups of people to return to buildings is safer than having all staff and students return to buildings. We also understand that one of the board's main justifications for having small group instruction, which may include transitioning into a full hybrid model in buildings, is to meet the needs of certain learners, like those learners that are learning English as a second language, those learners that may receive special education services that can't be delivered remotely, and those learners that continue to be disengaged from the learning process altogether. Additionally, the board has made it perfectly clear that the BCPSS reopening plans, which includes the safety guide for keeping staff and students safe in our buildings during the coronavirus pandemic is what staff, administrators, the community, and parents should refer to when wondering how BCPSS will deal with all of the safety measures, procedures, and protocols that are recommended to be in place prior to having people return to buildings and while people are in buildings. It's important that the board and everyone else in the BCPSS community has a clear understanding that the BTU does not trust nor evidence nor has evidence to believe that the BCPSS reopening plans, including the safety guide, are one, complete, two, being implemented properly, or three, well known and understood. We do have evidence and admittance that one, the plans are incomplete, 
See Appendix D if you want a brief example of incompletion. Two, some employees on site have reported that they haven't been given proper PPE. Administrators have to be reminded to wear masks. No, no one screened them before entering the building. A health screener was not wearing a face shield, which is required according to the district's plans, and that their workspaces are in the exact same condition as they left them, indicating that they have not been cleaned since March. And three, district leadership is not able to answer basic but very important questions about what the meal plan will be during a full hybrid model. I hope the board can now better understand why we are asking for full virtual learning for at least the first semester. Educators want to be back in person more than anything, but not until it's safe. We want our schools to have the best educational experience and since our district has proven to be limited in its ability to meet basic needs like providing toilet paper, providing AC, heat, windows that open, sufficient technology and fully staffed schools, BTU members stand ready to do everything we can safely do to our students' learning experience. As always, BTU members have gone above and beyond to create the best educational experience that they can, even in a virtual setting, and are using this new way of learning as an opportunity to increase our students' computer literacy skills. BTU members stand ready to continue going above and beyond to create the best educational experience for our students once we return to in-person learning, but we continue to be reminded that the district does not have final reopening plans, has gaps in enforcing the unfinished plans, lacks capacity to do something as simple as labeling occupancy maximums of classrooms, doesn't have enough money to implement the highest, not recommended, level of safety measures like proactive testing and doesn't have enough staff to execute one of the most basic safety measures, cleaning. With so many limitations, shortfalls and uncertainties, the BTU is once again asking the CEO to continue school fully virtual for the entire first semester. To be clear, we understand that this is a decision that the CEO can make without a board vote. But we also understand that the members of the board have influence and access to the CEO. We are asking you to use that influence and access and publicly encourage the CEO to continue school in a fully virtual setting for the entire first semester. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Ms. Melissa Joburg, who's representing the Parent Community Advisory Board. Hello, good evening. Good evening, board members. My name is Melissa Schober, and I am a Disability Rights Maryland appointee to the Parent and Community Advisory Board, or PCAB. On July 20th, City Schools announced that it would begin the year virtually and would provide an update on its next steps no later than October 16th. We are now just days away from an expected announcement regarding the continuation of virtual learning, the start of a hybrid model, or a full return to face-to-face -face instruction for 79,000 children and their families. PCAB has listened to the concerns and questions of students, families, and the community regarding reopening. I'm sure it will come as no surprise to the board that residents hold a myriad of opinion on whether schools should reopen, for which students, and on what timeline. In an effort to fulfill our statutory mission in advising this body, PCAB wishes to convey some common themes from our discussion and meeting. Safety. Families are deeply concerned about keeping their children safe, not only in the classroom, but during extracurricular activity, while commuting on MTA, at before and after care, and in other school-related settings, especially as positivity rates seem to be rising following phase three reopening. These concerns are heightened for families in which a child or adult has a chronic health condition that is likely to increase their risk for severe illness and or those with special needs, particularly for children that need assistance with toileting, feeding, and other tasks that demand close proximity. Balance. We have heard from families for whom distance learning is not working for a variety of reasons. Internet connectivity, child and sibling care demands, age and fit, that is, the social isolation and separation from the physical building, and lack of project-based or experiential learning. 
for some families, online learning has weakened their relationship to their school community and created uncertainty about their child's immediate and long-term academic success. These families see overwhelmed teachers and worry about burnout. After weighing the risks of in-person schooling in a distance environment with safety precautions and PPE against these losses, such families have said that they support or are leaning towards sending their children back for some amount of face-to-face -face instruction. Protecting community. Families have expressed profound concern about beloved teachers, custodians, school nurses, therapists, and other staff. How will their health be protected as they return to buildings, given that, according to the CDC, between 42 and 51 percent of all school employees nationwide meet the CDC's definition of being at increased risk for severe illness? Flexibility and choice. Again and again, we've heard families value choice. If schools reopen in a hybrid model or fully face-to-face, -face, families have emphasized the need to offer a completely virtual option until a vaccine or treatment is readily available. In the event that district reopens schools, families have said virtual programming must be robust and include ongoing technical support, must not force them to choose between physical safety and appropriate education, must not constitute a change of placement for children with special needs, and must serve students learning English. Worry. Families are aware that black and brown children are more likely to be hospitalized with COVID while also grappling with the reality that black and Latinx adults are much less likely to be able to work from home than white workers. The simultaneous pressures on black, brown and working class families in the midst of national austerity is evident in the questions we receive in which families express feeling intense stress. We ask that the board and administration keep these themes in mind as you decide on the form and function for the remainder of the school year. No matter what course the district chooses, families in the community have expressed that immediate, accurate and accessible communication is critical as they weigh their options. They have told us that such a plan must include information on whether and how students and personnel will be screened and tested, who will pay for such testing, particularly for the uninsured and uninsurable families how screening and testing results will be conveyed while protecting privacy, how PPE will be provided to students and personnel and on what basis it will be replaced, how distancing will be maintained, most especially in buildings that, as per the Comprehensive Educational Master Facilities Plan, are already at or above capacity, how ventilation systems will be initially evaluated and re-evaluated, the contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine procedures for students and personnel in the event of an exposure or positive test, including for students riding public transportation. The positivity thresholds for closing and reopening schools, how families, teachers, and the communities can report concerns with safety protocols and procedures without fear of retribution or shame, how reported concerns will be investigated and the remedy communicated back to the complainant, the plan for counseling in the event that a student or staff member falls ill or passes away. The list I just read is not meant to be exhaustive. Rather, it is meant to address the need for consistent, timely, and accurate information from the school system to families, not just a text survey that only allows yes, no answers or ask parents to reply one, if you believe your child is making academic progress and two, if they are not. In the absence of complete and reliable information, individuals will inadvertently share half-truths and rumors leading to confusion, mistrust, and further burdening children and families already under duress. PCAB strongly urges the district to release a detailed plan in English and Spanish for ongoing communication with parents and families alongside whatever other information will be released on October 16th or before. PCAB would like to partner with the district in developing, refining, and evaluating the opportunities and challenges in any communication plan. We hope to share our expertise and lived experience as parents and community members to strengthen the district's efforts in making whatever lies ahead successful and safe for our children and the hardworking staff of city schools. They deserve no less. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Schober. Um, and finally, we have um, the chair from CCAC, Ms. Winifred Winston. I don't see Ms. Winston, although I'm not sure if that 443986 is her, but if you're on a phone, I believe if you use star six, it should unmute you if you're on a phone.
So I believe I don't see her, but we can just come back if she's going to join later. Okay. Um, All right. So I turn it over to you then for the other public comment. Also, Mr. Gant. Okay, and these are all videos. Um, so I'm gonna start from the top. We have Miss Angelique Kane, and she wanted to speak on reopening. Hi, my name is Angelique, and I am the parent of four Baltimore City Public School students. My high school students use public transportation to commute to school. And that is my primary reason for being against reopening schools right now. Um, I know the district has taken a lot of consideration to protect students by putting them in cohorts, um, by having a model that will put them in cohorts throughout the day. Um, but I believe that the cohorts become null and void when students that use public transportation um, get back on public transportation. Um, they are then being exposed to the public and there's no way to um, to control that environment. Um, that's one, one reason. Another reason that I would like to highlight is I'm not sure about contact tracing. Does each school have its own system? Is there, is this something that the district will take on? Um, I'm not exactly sure about that. So um, for those two reasons, those two reasons are my primary reason um, for being 100% against reopening schools. Okay, give me one moment. Uh, next we have Natalia Sklonik. And she wanted to talk about a possible hybrid mo model during this time, so. Hi, my name is Natalia Skolnick. I have a kindergartner at Federal Hill Prep Elementary School, and I am filming this to send to you for my quiet space in the house uh, between synchronous and asynchronous time. Um, I have a kindergartner. I did not think virtual school would work, uh, but it's actually working surprisingly well. She really responds to the predictability, the schedule, the being able to see people, even though it's just virtual. Um, it's so much better than when we don't have a, a predictable schedule. And so I'm worried that the benefits will not outweigh the risks uh, if we move to hybrid. That when we move to hybrid, that if it's still largely Chromebook based and the kids still have to be in their desks and can't do all the fun things that they would if we didn't have this huge pandemic major health crisis. Um, I just, you know, I just don't know what the benefits of moving to a hybrid system are if the kids can't interact with each other and like move around and interact with the teacher. Like I understand why they can't, but if they can't, why do it? So I don't think hybrid will work so well for that reason. I also, you know, don't want to put our family and other families at risk. Um, we have a three-year-old. We did put her back in daycare. And so I am you know, talking from the experience of any time any of those little kids in our class have a sore throat or a runny nose or anything from that long list, the whole class gets shut down while the kid or the teacher gets tested. And even though that should be a 12 to 24 when, you know, hour window, at, if you get tested at the convention center, uh, in reality, sometimes it's been over a week just because of how long the wait is uh, when so many people get tested. If everyone goes back to school, that's way more people with runny noses and sore throats and a cough, anything like needing to get tested and their classes being disrupted while that happens. Um, so I don't want to lose, I don't want to lose what we have gained um, with, you know, creating a predictable situation and something that the, you know, the teachers, what they're doing is actually starting to really work and pay off, at least from what we're seeing over here. Um, I also just, I don't think Baltimore can risk more trauma and more death. Um, the worry alone as a parent of 
am I doing enough to keep my kids safe and my family safe is just, it's overwhelming. And with the disruption in school, like I can't get any work done anyway. So I would rather know what the schedule is with virtual school than go back to a hybrid system where maybe I'll have more time, but probably not because it'll be shut down most of the time. Thank you. Thank you for hearing us. Uh, next, we have Rebecca Yenawan from the Teachers Democracy Project. Virtual learning is our current reality. And after listening to parents and teachers, we know there are some obvious things that need to change. There are many teachers who are trying to respond to what they see happening by adjusting instruction to make it work for students and families. The challenge is that these adjustments make them out of compliance with district mandates. It seems clear that schools need to be given the flexibility to make adjustments to instruction. Specifically, we are asking the district to allow schools and teachers to make learning time more effective through greater use of small groups, one-on-one -on -one check ins, more appropriate breaks, and activities that could be done at one's own pace during a school day. Listen and learn from the wisdom of parents, teachers, and students who have proposed revised schedules and shared real life observations of attention span capacity. Number three, students should have a day off from live teaching where they can do work on their own and receive one-on-one -on -one check ins from their teachers. Here's what parents have to say. 30 minute lunchtime isn't enough for first graders to eat lunch and complete recess or any physical activity. First graders have an extremely difficult time remaining focused in such a large group with little to no opportunity to ask questions. Small groups allow for questions and participation in learning. Teachers are doing a great job under the circumstances. They need more room to experiment and adapt. My daughter adjusted well in the spring and grew to love more independent learning. She's having a tough time adapting to the long days of synchronous learning and seems to have lost the joy of learning she had in the spring. The days are absolutely too long for the youngest children. I firmly believe the online day should be cut in half with the live requirements. His teacher is fabulous, but it's canceling out because it's too long and he ends up hating it from exhaustion. The schedule requires my son to be in synchronous work from 9 to 3.30 with only a break for lunch. There is no asynchronous time built into the day. This leads to many classes going blank for long periods of time for kids to work independently. They could easily allow kids to log off for this time and log back in for synchronous work later in the day. I'm helping my kindergartner and another kindergartner in her class log on and with whatever else they need during the day which is usually help logging into the learning apps or Zoom calls, which are often problematic to get into a third of the time. They are both ready to do work that is far more advanced than what is presented by Eureka Math and of the Haggerty phonemic awareness videos that have started at a really basic level. The asynchronous work that gets assigned is a ton of busy work. If there was more asynchronous time and teachers could actually check in individually, they could better assess where the kids are really at and then support them accordingly. My child in middle school is really struggling. We are a month into school and every Zoom meeting, half the class doesn't know which link or they can't get into the meeting. Very frustrating for all to be waiting 20 minutes to start a lesson. Also, I feel like time is being filled mostly with I ready lessons, no authentic learning, just practicing for the test. My child spends extensive amounts of time staring at that computer. After a while, he gets restless, so not much information is being absorbed. We can also tell our teachers are suffering, having to do this all day. Give them more freedom. Okay. Practicing for the test. My child spends extensive oh. amounts of time staring at that computer. After a while, he gets rest. Sorry about that. Uh, next, we have Ms. Sarah, Sarah Stovis before, before, and she wants to talk about the financial update. Hi, my name is Sarah Baffour, and I'm coming to today as a former administrator. I had the honor to serve as an assistant principal for an international middle school. My primary role while being an assistant principal was to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of our schoolhouse. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank you all for taking the time to hear from stakeholders like myself in order to share our voices and our thoughts and to give you an added perspective. One 
Our number one responsibility as an administrator is to keep our students safe. We cannot do any learning or instruction until that primary objective is achieved and maintained. As administrators, parents and staff, we need to come together during this time to work through the logistics of being back into the classroom. Because like you, I share that goal of being back someday. We need to determine what materials are needed. How will they be paid for? Get them ordered and have them on site. We learned with the purchasing of our Chromebooks that even the best laid plans can have pitfalls when executed. We need to make sure that the materials are on site before the first student comes back. We do not need to rush to go back to the classroom. We need to use this time of virtual learning as a gift of time so we can focus on making the classrooms a safer environment for everyone, not just our students, but also for our teachers and staff. One of my strengths as an administrator was to be able to look at the details and logistics needed in order to see a project through. Before my time is over, I want to walk you through the logistics of just one part of the school day when we arrive. Our current plans for returning to school involve safety measures that include temperature checks, asking questions, and hand sanitizing or hand washing upon the arrival. For students who are bused in, will we do this before they're even on the bus? For those who are arriving at school, whether being dropped off or walking, who will be available to see this through? I know for my school in particular, which is Medfield Heights Elementary School, the available staff from our support team who would have been able to do this have been laid off. Furthermore, at this point, I don't know if we have the resources on site to allow for this and if it will allow for multiple checkpoints. For example, if it takes as little as 30 seconds to check a student's temperature, ask them questions about how they're feeling and make sure that they have cleansed their hands, with a population of almost 400 students, it would take about three hours for every student to get checked and entered into the building. That's with a single checkpoint. These are just some of the logistics that we need to work through for every single school in our system before we set our return date. I thank you for your time. Next, we have Mr. Tyrone Barnwell from the Parent Power Group also discussing reopening. Uh, Do you all feel about going back into schools. We should not re-enter the buildings until it is safe to do so. No matter if you're a principal um, or a part of custodial staff, I, I really feel like you have no business being in schools right now to deem some staff essential enough to work out of that context and uh, deem others uh, not. Uh, I, I believe it's unfair. I am all for the conversation starting now so that we could plan and have a really good plan. But as far as implementation, um, I would at least like to see us get through this particular flu season before we explore the idea of trying to put our children back in school. I, I have questions about um, why this is being discussed and why it's being pursued. And I think that it definitely um, illustrates and um, improves that money um, is definitely more important than the value of our children. When we look at the demographics of Baltimore City, look at how many of our black and brown babies are in these schools, um, you can see very clearly that our children, in my opinion, that our children are expendable. I don't think it's safe to go back. And I'm mad that like that parents are being asked to make this decision on a family by family basis. Um, I mean, the idea of like, this is why you have leadership as leaders think about the greater good and they they protect you even when your feelings are like i want something better for my baby right now like i don't want my child to be sitting at home struggling with this virtual space and not learning anything um and yet it is what we need to be doing right now okay. uh Next, we have Mr. Jason Butler. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Butler's a parent um, and his kids attend Liberty Elementary and Carver. Anyone to discuss the financial update? 
Good afternoon. My name is Jason Butler. Um, I've got four kids currently in the Baltimore City public school system. Um, I'd like to start off, I, I'm the first to say that kids need to be in school. Uh, the, the work that, that our teachers do, um, the work that our principals and administrators do, and um, really just the social benefits of being in a school with other kids their age, you know, we, you can't. These are all intangibles, the, the experience that our teachers are able to provide in, in those classrooms um, are incomparable to anything that, that distance learning can provide. That being said, there's absolutely no way that I'm allowing any of my children to attend a, uh, a school in person with the current health crisis at hand. Um, the reason that I say this is for many reasons, but first of all, um, my, my my job as a parent is to ensure the health uh, and welfare of my children. Um, that's also, um, as a parent, uh, leaving my very young children, my youngest uh, kids are my twins, they're um, in the first grade, they'll be seven this year. Um, I entrust them in the custody of the school for a uh, significant portion of the day. That means I trust them with their health and welfare. Um, sending them out, I, I don't even take them to the grocery store with me because I don't need them to get sick. I don't need them to take a chance of, of getting sick. Um, as much as I don't want them to get sick, when um, now the research has actually shown us that kids are not immune to this disease or less susceptible to it, kids are getting sick and some kids are unfortunately uh, succumbing to the, to the disease. But um, in addition to that, I have a grandmother that's 91 years old. Every day that my kids are in public, is two weeks away from their great grandmother whose time on this earth is limited. Um, that is unacceptable to me. I'm not putting any member of my family at risk for a decision that I for one feel is potentially politically motivated. Uh, the only thing that matters at the end of the day, as important as education is, is the health, the health and welfare of, of our kids. Um, the health and welfare of our older and, and um, and vulnerable populations. You know, we have to make decisions that are responsible to to all of of us, all of our neighbors. You know, it, it's anything less than that. You know, we we are losing sight of what we're here for, what what our kids are here for. Uh, we're we're here to make sure that they have the things that they need to survive in this world. And in order for them to survive, they need to be alive. Thanks. Next, we'll hear from Patrice Pilgrim. I believe she's a parent at Northwood Elementary and she wanted to talk about reopening. Good afternoon, my name is Patrice Pilgrim and um, my reason for making this video is simple. I would like to implore the school board to exercise the authority that you have, the power that you have to ensure that my children and other thousands of other children like my children across the district are safe and continue to be safe during this pandemic. I am referring to the vote tonight with regards to when we should begin the return to in-person learning. I am also a teacher. I love the person-to-person -person interactions. I love interacting, hugging, having heated and interesting debates with my students. I love my job. Trust me when I tell you, I'm not in it for the money and for the quote-unquote prestige. I'm in it because I believe in what I do and in what my colleagues do. The reality is that everyday teachers across this district do make do or make much with very little in terms of resources. And uh, that's on a normal day. I am not seeing as a parent and as a teacher where the district has sufficient resources and supports in place to ensure not only my safety, but the safety of my children if I were to send them back to school. The reality is that as a parent, I am not going to be sending my babies back to in-person school because I am not confident that the district has sufficient resources, nor do I think that they have uh, 
the sufficient staff to enforce these health and safety guidelines that are going to be necessary to ensure the safety of my child, of my children. I don't like having to teach and interact with my students over video camera. I don't. But if the choice is between doing that and being in a situation that is not safe for not only me, but especially isn't safe for my students, then I believe you guys know the choice that I'm going to take. The reality is that we do not have sufficient resources. The district has not demonstrated that it has the resources necessary and the manpower necessary to get students and staff back into schools and it's so with that in mind that i ask you guys to exercise the power and uh, the authority that you all have and vote for a fully virtual first semester and let us negotiate with fidelity with all of the relevant stakeholders uh, to put the resources and the materials in place to ensure that when we do return to some type of in-person learning model everyone is going to be safe I am not prepared to put my life on the line and to put my children's lives on the line. And so I ask you guys, the school board, to do what is necessary to keep all of us safe. Uh, next, we have Mr. Sam Hopkins. Um, and he also wanted to speak about, oh, his, his children go to Hamden. Uh, he also wanted to speak about reopening. Hi, my name is Sam Hopkins. Uh, I have two children at Hamden Elementary Middle School. They're in third and first grade and have been at the school uh, since uh, kindergarten and pre-K respectively. My oldest son uh, is, has special needs. He is on the autism spectrum. Um, and uh, he is currently uh, completely mainstreamed for class, including in the digital environment. My comment today is to say that um, as a parent, as a vice president of the PTO at Hamden, as a the cub master of Hamden PAC 151, um, and as a longtime youth sports coach, an active parent in the, in the neighborhood, talks to many, uh, many other parents, um, I know from my own experience and, and from the perspective of many others that we do not have enough data to feel good about going back to school, both because of uh, uh, cohabitation circumstances like my parents who are over 70 years old who live with me and um, my elementary school age sons and for teachers who uh, are also in at risk groups uh, and who uh, need to be able to teach confidently uh to the kids who, who they who they love and uh, who they've known for many years um, i work at johns hopkins in medical technology and innovation and i know that while a lot is in development we are not um, on october 13th where we hope to be in terms of uh, being able to really turn the corner into 2021 more and more workplaces corporate america at all levels and johns hopkins offices and uh, college campuses are putting off uh, true return to offices until mid-year uh, 2021 or later. Um, this should be a cue for uh, the schools. I we are we are slogging through virtual, but I know that I'll be home and able to to help my sons. And everyone is being fairly forgiving with each other professionally. Um, the worst outcome would be for more economic damage uh, or more damage to people's job stability to be done uh, because of a, a hasty return to work and school uh, that it, uh, makes the virus problems worse and leads to a sudden uh, and harsh shutdown. Um, my urge and uh, what I urge you is to take more data and more patience and make sure that Maryland and Johns Hopkins and Baltimore City are on the same page and um, allow everyone uh, to take their time uh, building a better virtual system and also uh, building safety for when we do return to school. The kids will be okay. Thank you. And we have one more video. I just wanted to check one more time. Is Ms. Winston, are you on? Uh, 
Okay. And our last public comment is from Ms. Emily Jascott. She is a parent with a um, child at Patterson High School and she wanted to talk about reopening. Hi, my name is Emily Jascott. I am the parent of a 10th grade ESOL student at Patterson High School. Baltimore City Schools, please do not reopen school buildings yet. Not until it's safe. Now, I know that so many of us have had to make big changes and sacrifices to implement virtual learning this year. In my family, my son has headaches from staring at his computer screen all day and is feeling very isolated from all of his friends. And I personally have had to change my work schedule from full time to part time so that I can be available to help him because he is still learning English and this is his only his second year in the United States schools. But I'm willing to do that because he needs the help and because I know that this is what has to happen to keep us all safe. The students need to keep learning virtually. Baltimore cannot afford to spread COVID through our students, our teachers, their families, and our community. The risk is just too great to reopen this year. Now, my family is going to continue isolating as much as possible, limiting interactions with other people, social distancing, wearing masks, and washing our hands so that we can stay healthy. We are not in a position to go back into schools until community transmission rates are way down or until there is a vaccine that everyone can access. So I thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our opinions. And thank you for taking the time to listen. And please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Okay, and that was the last of public comment. And uh, Chair Chenya, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, folks who signed up for uh, to to uh, speak to us this evening. Uh, board members, um, based on public comments, are there any additional items that you would like to pull from the consent agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve items 8.01 and 8.02? So moved, Commissioner James. Seconded, and Frank. Thank you. I'll call those, I'll do the roll call for those in favor. Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Brooks? Yes. Commissioner Frank? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. Commissioner McFadden? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Reed? Uh, yes. Commissioner Roberts? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Sykes? Yes. Okay, and um, I'm also in favor. There's no opposition, so that's nine in favor and one absent. So that uh, motion passes. Um, and we we pulled um, item 12, two of them with the same question. Item 12.02, Great Minds, PBC, and 12.03 math and literacy intervention programs, and it was around um, the relationship to the CARES, um, the use of this, I think the funding and the CARES funding and how it relates to these, um, these two programs. Uh, 
Totally. Good evening. Uh, my name is Josh Bailey. I'm the Director of Operations for the Office of Teaching and Learning. So the uh, intervention RFP, the Math and Literacy Intervention, and the uh, Contract for Great Minds, those two contracts were originally established prior to the school closure due to COVID. And so these increased requests are reflective of the spending that occurred on the CARES Tutoring Act. And then we'll establish or reestablish spending capacity on both of those contracts for the remainder of the school year if we need them in the future. Uh, it is not a reflection of new spending, uh, merely uh, restoring the spending capacity for future uh, grant opportunities or other spending that is uh, yet to occur. I guess uh, another question is, um, how much do we get in CARES and how is that money being earmarked to other programs, specifically in teaching and learning? So uh, the CARES tutoring grant um, is was a total of $27 million with some set aside for the charter schools. Um, and so your your question about how it's being split a, a, across um, is that there's a number of vendors that we are using for both print materials like Great Minds to provide workbooks to our students. We're providing some text that was an a, uh, the vendor AKJ that you saw a board letter for uh, in a previous board meeting, as well as establishing partnerships with various vendors that provide online interventions, such as Discovery Education, Zern, and Imagine Learning. So is there a way we can get a laundry list to know how we're using that? The source, the source we know is 27 million, but we can get a laundry list in terms of the uses of those funds. Specifically to teaching and learning, absolutely. I can prepare that and send it to the board office. Well, just doesn't have to be teaching and learning. I'm just, I just mean the care is mine. Okay, Commissioner Reed, are you asking for for the total cares money or for the cares money towards for tutoring? I would say, uh, I would, I would say both. Uh, okay, Commissioner Reed. Yes. Uh, this is Chris Doherty, and um, yes, we can certainly get you that. Uh, that list essentially matching uh, sources and uses of the CARES money. I will note probably what you already know, which is that um, it, it will be as of the time we pull it together. Um, what I mean by that is some of that money is uh, won't have been spent yet, but all, right. all the money, right, all the money that has been spent will be indicated and all the money that we have earmarked uh, for spending will be indicated. So in addition to what Josh will do with a TNL uh, teaching and learning focus, um, we'll make sure you get that list as well, uh, Commissioner Reed. Yeah, I think that helps the board in terms of understanding. Of course, ha uh, happily. We, we essentially have it now, so um, as you would expect, and we'll be happy to share that with you. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Roberts. Uh, Commissioner Reed and Chief Dotery, I know that you all have a budget update um, rescheduled for November. Is it possible to provide the information for the operations committee during that time um, as opposed to just sending it as an email? Could you provide that during your budget update for the November operations meeting? C Commissioner Roberts, you mean um, um, what we just talked about rather than just sending it to you present it to you at the november ops committee meeting is that what you're asking absolutely i think that would be a very appropriate forum for that by all means yes i was just making sure i understood your question and and um yes by all means if that you know because i know that the money had to pot potentially be spent by the end of november with all invoices paid by december and so if that would make for a better and easier transition to deliver that for commissioner reed um, I know we had that meeting in November, so that would probably be a good time. But by all means, Commissioner Roberts, and you're right that the the tutoring portion of the CARES Act um, has a particularly um, near term spending window and the November Ops Committee meeting uh, would be delighted to uh, present uh, present that then and um, be able to discuss it uh, in that forum. Thank you so much, Chief. Thank you. Commissioner Brooks, did you have a question? I do, but it's not about this topic. Okay. Okay. 
Any any other questions on or for these two items? If not, is is uh, is there a motion to accept um, to approve item twelve point zero two and twelve point zero three? So move, read. Okay, Commissioner Reed. Okay. Second. A second. Thank you. Uh, and I'll I'll do the um, those in favor, um, Commissioner Bondima. Uh, yes. Okay, Commissioner Brooks. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Frank. Yes. Commissioner James. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner McFadden. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Reed. Yes. Commissioner Roberts. Yes. Okay, and I'm in favor. So that was, um, and no one is opposed, no abstention. So we have um, eight in favor and one absent, and this motion also passes. Um, is there a motion to approve the remaining consent agenda? So moved. So moved. Second read. I heard Brooke. Read seconds. <laughs> okay. I heard, uh, was that Brooks that I heard with the motion yes. and read just, okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bondim, are you in favor? Yes. The remaining? Okay, thank you. Commissioner Brooks? Yes. Frank? Yes. Yes. James? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Reed? Yes. Roberts? Yes. And I'm in favor, so that is um, eight in favor, one absent. This one, this is also this motion also passes. Okay. I'm checking to see the um, where we are on the agenda. I believe we have um, covered all of the information items. There was uh, one committee. Uh, but I and, and that met and that was teaching and learning. Commissioner McFadden, have you you posted a report? Yes, ma'am, it's posted. Thank you. I, I do. I mean, all I can mention, if I may, just for a moment, mm -hmm. um, and it's okay. very brief. The 21st Century Learning Academic Plan. I just want to mention the schools um, a, a little bit about them. I mean, uh, Mary E. Robin Elementary School. Dawn Shirey and uh, the 21st Century Learning, the academics team, they're doing a really great job in making sure that um, there is, you know, great programming and instructional focus, um, focuses in our 21st century spaces. And to Commissioner Sykes's point, who um, brilliantly serves on our committee as well, he raised the point of getting to a point where all of our schools will be able to have um, uh, access to, to programs like the ones that are in 21st century spaces. That ultimately means that all of our schools have to be brought up to 21st century standards. Um, so it just goes back to our point of advocacy again um, and how we continue to push um, and work with all of our partners to make sure that our young people are receiving um, the adequate education that they deserve. But yes, Mary E. Robin, Hollabird Academy has an environmental sustainability focus and they are net zero school. Graceland Park Elementary Middle School project based, they're also net zero. Um, Medfield Heights, STEAM, Walter P. Carter, these are schools in Lowe's T. Murray that are um, soon to be opening. So we're opening these 21st century schools. And I just wanted um, to highlight the work of um, Don Shirey. And then we also had a, a wholeness presentation from our wholeness staff and the incredible work that was started pre-COVID, during COVID, and now as we're moving into school year 2021, um, the work that they're doing all throughout our system, but particularly in um, our learning centers um, and the resources that are being placed into those spaces um, are great. And then also to my colleagues, all of us, we should be looking forward to the ESSA Consolidated um, Plan 
which we'll be voting on soon. So I just want to make sure that you all are keeping that on the forefront of your, your brains. Thank you. Commissioner Brooks, did you did you want to speak on something previous or did you want to lead us into our general discussion? Um, it was a, a it's kind of related to um, this okay. camera's on the side. I'm sorry that I look like I'm on angle, mm -hmm. um, but um, it was uh, really a, a, a couple of reflections. Um, so particularly tied to the budget um, presentation that we received earlier today. Uh, we talked about this, this physical cliff that we're approaching, um, and uh, Commissioner McFadden talked specifically about the importance of advocacy around uh, Kerwin. Um, and I, I, I want us to also be uh, thinking really intentionally about sort of not only doing that advocacy, but also levels of transparency and what that might look like, given that if this is if the gap that we have is going to lead to teacher turn uh, layoffs or anything at the district, what does our community transparency plan look like to make sure that we're involving people who are going to be most impacted by decisions of uh, inadequate funding? And so that's kind of one point that I want to sort of uh, put out there. Um, I think the second part was uh, particularly looking at um, sort of how we were characterizing um, sort of this reopening uh, uh, from Dr. Santelis's comments a little bit earlier today, um, particularly around this notion of equity, which I think we continue to see as um, something that um, that is completely um, continue to be misused and mischaracterized and misrepresented, it, misrepresented. And so I just want us to be clear that when we're talking about equity, it tells us that we need to pay attention to the disparities and not put people right back in harm's way. And so um, from my perspective, by taking the most vulnerable and sort of using that as an opportunity to sort of put people at, at, at risk, um, are also the same people um, who are growing up in concentrated poverty, um, who might be living in intergenerational households, and we're in the middle of a pandemic where over 250,000 people have died, um, most of them being uh, black and brown folks. And so I just kind of wanted to, to, to flag that um, and, and to go on record as saying that is not something that I don't, I think that's a, a misrepresentation of equity. Um, and I think that's something that we, we need to sort of consider. Um, and I think the last point that I would like to make um, is that just on Sunday was National Coming Out Day. Um, and I know our district is trying to do better around LGBT kids and our staff. Um, I just kind of want to give recognition um, because I did not see that come out from the district. Um, and so I want to just acknowledge the LGBT students um, who uh, live and exist and move within our district and also to elevate the, the, the staff people who um, continue to do this work um, in ways in which they may or may not be um, affirmed on a regular basis. So those were sort of some of my general reflections. Okay, um, I'm going to take that as the opening to our uh, portion of the meeting where folks can uh, give reflections or or bring up topics. I know this is sort of related to what we're doing, but we're not we didn't we're not taking um, action formally as a board uh, tonight. So it's so the floor is open because we've met the criteria for our time to talk. Just a reminder that this is not time for public comment. Um, and um, everyone is invited to participate in this along with the CEO. So if anyone else would like to weigh in either in response uh, or other, other uh, reflections or ideas that you'd like to bring forward. I, I will just start to say that um, if, if, if our past be behavior um, is any indication of what our future will be, the experience that I've had uh, on the board, whenever we've had an occasion where there has there has been um, the possibility of um, uh, of an impact, a fiscal impact uh, to the to the extent that it might in fact involve, I'll just use the term downsizing or whatever whatever term we might have to use. Uh, that we have been. Uh, in my experience, very transparent. And so I would I would expect that that would be the same case, you know, if that if 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 in fact that were to be uh, to come to pass, I, I don't think it, it's much of a surprise to folks that uh, when, when you, you know, just listening to the report this evening, the fact that we have maintained um, full time employees fully paid since March in the midst of all the things that have happened and huge um, expenses that were not in the budget. And so um, while we are, while we are can um, sort of tread water this year, uh, I think everyone 
will be at the table and be very much aware. So to, so to the point that Commissioner McFadden made that, you know, all of us pulling together in terms of, a, a, of being advocates for what the system is really going to need around funding uh, makes it much more crucial. But I do expect that we will continue to be transparent. That's the way we've been in the past. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, in terms of most of the communication from the public, uh, I mean, it's really skewed toward people saying we should stay virtual. Is that truly, I mean, how can I discern whether that's truly representative of all Baltimore City school parents or just a group that's more vociferous in terms of how they feel about things? How does one discern that? Well, uh, you're at uh, I'm, I, my, my response, <laughs> my response would be that, um, you know, some of the information I believe that we've been um, uh, been get, getting uh, in terms of some of the meetings that we've had uh, and just looking at the responses from the surveys and things that parents have done. Uh, similar to the surveys that we did prior to the opening opening of this school year, it's a it's a quite a variety of responses, and um, from uh, folks who who would say they would you know would be interested in people being in school, some children being in school, to parents on the on the side of saying that they would not want their children to come. I will also remind us all that our reopening plan. Uh, indicates very clearly that the option of, of um, online virtual is there. We're not, no one has said that that is being removed. Um, and so the, the element that I hear is the element of choice, um, considering what we have been saying since summer, the fact that we have students who, um, considering the safety issue, considering all the things, and I hear that clearly, but we still have students that are, we are losing by the moment um, because for all that we are doing, it's still not meeting their needs. And that we, we still have an obligation to come up with some way to try to meet their needs within I, that component of choice, which is also a piece I, I see of equity in terms of parents being able uh, to, to make a decision if they feel that that's the decision for their family. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm not sure if you saw it, but uh, Commissioner Sykes, right. his hand was raised. I'm, oh, thank you. I was moving down that way. Commissioner Sykes, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted oh. to say Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. I just want to say that tonight's meeting has went fairly well. Um, and I just wanted to point out some few things um, that I've been working on um, with Miss uh, with uh, Commissioner Roberts and Commissioner McFadden, and e also even some people from um, within ASCBC and, um, you know, just fellow people around the district. Uh, I decided to come up with a, a student commissioner action plan. Some things that um, within the uh, month of October that I want to get done and things that I wanted to uh, get com completed. Um, some of those things were, um, I think one of the biggest things, which was uh, Ms. Um, Commissioner McFadden and uh, Commissioner Roberts brought up to me was, I was trying to figure out a way, how can I reach these students and get input? Um, and so I think the biggest thing was that they both came up with the uh, student commissioner office hours. So within the next few, I think within the next few days, hopefully I can launch, um, launch the student commissioner office hours where I began to go um, so I, I want to start with high schoolers, talking to them, um, getting their input on how they feel about different things. And one of the main things that I am um, really want to focus on is the is the, the updated grading policy. As we all know, last year we had an um, a, a updated grading policy. And I want them, I want to get an understanding of how they feel um, with the upgraded policy, the updated I'm sorry, the updated grading policy with um with being in the pandemic, being um virtual, how do you see that this grading policy is affecting you and your grades? Um also um I want to for students who don't know that today, um October 13th is the last day. If you're if you're eligible to vote, please get out there and register.
to you have until eleven fifty nine to vote um to register to vote. So please make sure that you do that. And um, make sure that you do vote because your vote is important. Um, and I've been wanting to really push that because a lot of the students don't, um, they don't know that, that that they can vote. And I think that they need to know that they can. So please make sure that you have until 11.59 tonight to register. So make sure that you register the vote so you can vote when the voting time comes. Um, and I think that was just pretty much my my piece. And I look forward to working with everyone and uh um, sitting on the, the uh, Teaching and Learning Committee so far has been wonderful, and I hope to uh, to sit in on some other committee meetings soon. Thank you, Commissioner Sykes, uh, and, th and thank you for that encouragement uh, to register to vote, and I do hope all of our students take advantage of it. Um, my, my, the young students in my family uh, were shocked when they read the story about um, uh, Shaquille O'Neal saying this was the first time that he had voted. And so I think that's a great reminder for us to let our, our young people know, uh, take advantage of your first time and go vote now. Thank you. Okay, last chance. Uh, do I see a hand, Madam? Madam Chair, I think Commissioner James was um, had her hand up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay with you. It's uh, it's it's blending excellent. with Thank your you. score. And sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Kyrie, uh, for that reminder on voting. One thing I'd just like to I don't need any answers now, but would like flagged really, you know, more clearly for the public as we move forward is as we look at hybrid and yeah. online and in-person mm -hmm. options. What's the guidance around student activities and student clubs, um, athletics, uh, debate, band, choir, drama, the pieces? And is there a possibility of leveraging those as part of the the comeback? You know, um, there tend to be smaller groups of people. They tend to be, you know, a, a group of people that has greater community and may understand social distancing separating easier um, and a way we could use that to leverage to engage kids and, and keep them involved and support those things that they love that feed their soul about school um, as, as we're doing this transition plan. So think, thinking about some guidance around that for the student organizers, the faculty advisors um, and community partners, I think might be really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm boring. Commissioner Brooks, I are you is your hand up? It's hard to tell. Uh, no, it's not. Chair Chair Chair, oh, just oh, okay. Dr. Santelis's hand is up. I yeah, I, I was oh. I was going back there. Just want to make sure. Dr. Santelis, go ahead. No, that's fine. I understand the uh, search for the raised hand <laughs> is easy one on these. Um, no, I just wanted to add, because I know the question, um, you know, that, that Commissioner Reed raised earlier about, um, you know, how we're getting feedback. And we, we really are still committed to doing a variety of surveys. Um, so some of the more in-depth surveys, um, but also the recent POSIP, uh, which we got really like 30,000 responses um, because folks could do it on their cell phone. It could be quick. Um, no, it's not in depth, but it does allow us um, to get some of that real time. And one of the things we saw was, was the differentiated um, need among families in Baltimore City. And again, you know, I'll just restate, we're not a monolith. And so what we saw was about 50% of families um, wanted to remain completely virtual. And I think we heard um, a lot of that this evening. Um, we also had about 25% of families who said, I'm not sure yet. I don't know. I would need to know more. And I think we heard that this evening as well. We heard from a variety of places that folks want more detail um, about what the plan looks like. And then we had 25% of families who absolutely said yes. Um, we do want an in-person option. We have the families who have opted into the student learning centers, 70% of whom um, are homeless. And, uh, and I think what we've seen, again, as I have gone into classrooms, um, is that our families 
deserve the power of choice. Other families have choice. Our families deserve the power of choice. And so um, what we have always promoted, what the board um, I think has been incredibly supportive of, um, it is the frame that I've taken, um, is that frankly nobody um, should be summarily with that kind of differentiated need that's being expressed. Nobody, at least of all me, has the right to just summarily take away um, folks' choice. And so part of what we're doing is working again to address um, a lot of the themes that we heard tonight are reflected continually in the data. The questions, the concerns, the desire for choice, and the fact that some families, even though they may not be represented here tonight, um, do want an in-person option. And, you know, I often refer to, you know, one of the moms um, at one of the learning centers at Lakeland that I visited, you know, over a week ago. And she was dropping her first or second grader off. She had on her work uniform and she was smiling from ear to ear. Her baby was smiling from ear to ear as he got to go back to class. And that you know, that needs to be an option at the same time that we heard from families tonight that have incredibly good reasons um, why they uh, very much want to keep their children home. And so um, I think that it's important to know that the data is showing what we heard tonight. And so I would just want to add and chime in there, um, particularly around the, the notion of choice, because I think that's what's really, really important here. So my stance is that Yes, we have families who want to have access to some in-person instruction, but the, 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 my challenge is, particularly for the district, uh, whose choice? Because at some point you're gonna compulsorily require teachers to be back in the space. So it's not gonna be all parents, you know, so it's not this one 25%, it's gonna require everybody to be there. So it's not actually full choice. It is actually only choice for some people. And I just want us to be clear when we're talking about that, it's like, you know, so like our administrative staff are going to be forced to come back. Um, even if they don't want to. So, I, so, so for me, the, the, this, this, this framing of choice is limited and problematic, partly because um, it denies the, the, the very choice that you're talking about you want to give to families to our own employees. So I think that's sort of what I'm talking about. No, and, and I think that's a really important point, mm -hmm. Commissioner Brooks. And I think that um, as I've, I've, I've tried to acknowledge and will continue to acknowledge, we are living in an imperfect world with trade-offs. Um, and the reality is we cannot be everything for everyone. And sure, um, we are taking into account what we are hearing from staff. And given that, you know, and I think that we need to continue to weigh all of the considerations. I think we have done that. Um, we have compelled some staff to come back, but we also know um, that we have staff that we have not compelled to come back. And as Commissioner Jenia noted, we've worked very hard um, to keep full-time staff intact. And so we're, we're working in a complicated world. Um, and I will, you know, my, but, but my first responsibility um, is to make sure that families have choice, but to make sure everyone is safe. And, um, you know, so that, that will be shown. And I think what will be shown in terms of what we roll out is that we are not compelling an entire staff um, to return. And I think folks will be able to see that. Um, but yes, you are absolutely right. There are trade-offs. And I think that's why this kind of time is really important so that we can hear different perspectives um, and be forthright about what our definitions of equity are, what our frames are. And so I think it's important that you raise it um, directly. And yes, there's, you know, there's a question. Um, absolutely, when I got my POSIP survey for all who care, not that you need to care, but someone you know, said it, I actually would send my kids back. And I answered yes, that's not because I think that's the right choice for every family. Um, but I, you know, I have a daughter um, who needs to be back. Um, and I'm watching and we're dealing and we're doing that. And I probably have one that would be fine virtual um, if we went virtual for the entire part of the year. But that's, that's something that our family is making together. And I don't want to take that away from anybody else's family. Um, so, you know, I only ask that because somebody in the chat, I only answered and spoke to that from someone in the chat. Um, it is absolutely complicated. And I hope no one would ever take that I thought it was easy, but I think that there are trade-offs. I agree we need to make them explicitly. And 
I, yeah, as, as a parent, I, I would send my child back. And I, I actually answered that on the PASA. But me wanting to send my child back should not supersede someone else's ability to make the best choice for their family as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Madam Chair. Thank you, everyone. Yes, Commissioner Chen. Very quickly, I just, uh, two things. Um, I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Brooks for mentioning um, a national coming out day, but on Monday, yesterday, um, it was also what um, a lot of us celebrated was Indigenous Peoples Day. And I wanted to make sure that we highlighted that um, day also. Someone who has um, heritage, you know, Native American heritage, I think um, it was a great opportunity for us to make yesterday a teachable moment for our young people um, and to make sure that we are celebrating the culture, the customs and beliefs of, 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 of all people, I think is important. And then secondly, um, I would be remiss. I know that it did not make our agenda today um, in our moment of silence. Um, but a frat brother of mine, a fraternity brother of mine um, in Symphonia, Phi Mu Alpha, um, his name is Shannon Cotman. Shannon Cotman was an employee of City Schools, um, and we uh, did um, the Emerging Leaders Program with new leaders together um, in 2015. Mm -hmm. He passed away last Wednesday, um, and we attended Morgan State University together. He was a part of uh, Spring 06, that line there. And so I, I would be remiss if I didn't speak his name. He was a champion um, for education, um, especially for young black men in this city. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we honored him. I know it will come in a later meeting where we recognize him in a moment of silence, but he still has a wife, Bridget Cotman. We, we pepped her, we approved her to be an assistant principal a few uh, months back and they have a small child. So. I just wanted to make sure that um, I, I spoke his name. I said that in this setting um, tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Friends, um, we, we have come to the end of our evening. Um, is there anything else that we need to say this evening before I ask for a motion to adjourn? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? Madam Chair, I move that we adjourn our meeting tonight. Thank you, Commissioner McFadden. Is there a second? Second, Brooks. Great. If there is no opposition, I'm going to say that this motion passes. Is there any? Seeing none, um, the meeting is adjourned. Everyone, thank you for a good meeting. Please uh, be careful, stay safe. If you need to register to vote, you still have several hours, please go and do that. And uh, we will see you all very soon. And I didn't read the, oh my goodness, I didn't read the list of the upcoming meetings, but they are on our website, so please read them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you to join um, in virtually if you can. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.